Welcome to the Congress Author Podcast Series, brought to you by the Cytokine Signaling Forum, where authors review their Congress posters and presentations on cytokine signaling and JAK inhibitors. This edition, recorded at ACR 2019 in Atlanta, focuses on Phil Gottenib. In the first two presentations, Professor Taylor and Professor Westhovens present the latest data from the Finch studies. Hello, pleasure to be joining you from the ACR 2019 meeting. My name's Peter Taylor from the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. So I'd like to tell you about key inflammatory biomarkers at baseline taken from the Finch study. And this is the Finch 2 study with Phil Gottenib in rheumatoid arthritis. So first of all, let's start off by talking about the study itself. So Finch 2 was a phase 3 study, double-blind, randomised, controlled, placebo study to evaluate the effects of filgotinib versus placebo for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. So these were patients with moderate to severe rheumatoid arthritis despite background conventional synthetic DMARDs who had an ad- inadequate response or intolerance to at least one biologic DMARD. So this is a quite refractory population. And they were randomised in a one-to-one-to-one manner to filgotinib 200 milligrams once daily together with methotrexate or filgotinib 100 milligrams once daily together with methotrexate or placebo plus methotrexate. The primary endpoint was at week 12 and what we're doing here is to look at a biomarker analysis and these are biomarkers based on uh, peripheral blood predominantly and the sampling times were at baseline week 0, at week 4 and week 12. Now, to undertake this study, there was a logistic and linear regression model fitted to assess the multiplicative interaction between each baseline biomarker and whether it was low, meaning less than the median, or high, meaning greater than the median, and once daily filgotinib, uh, 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams relative to placebo. And the effect was looked at at the time points of week 4 and week 12. And what we were seeking to ask here is whether there was a relationship between those baseline biomarkers and a clinical response. And the clinical response was measured in a number of different ways, by the categorical responses of ACR 20, 50 or 70, by ACRN or by the continuous measure of DAS 28 CRP. Multiple testing correction was performed using a false discovery rate and in fact only the cytokines that reached a threshold of less than 0.2 based on a false discovery uh, are being reported in this particular work. We also looked at the numbers needed to treat for various response measures uh, based on the baseline cytokines measured. So if we now look to uh, some of the biomarkers that were measured, we actually identified a a number that uh, were of interest here, and these included chemokines, acute phase markers, uh, cytokines, matrix metalloproteinases, and some adhesion molecules. And specifically, uh, CCL3, CRP, CXCL10, CXCL13, IL18, 5, and 6, MMP3, serum amyloid A, VCAM1, VGFA, and the ratio of soluble ICAM1 to CXCL13. We were particularly interested to look at CXCL13 and soluble ICAM1 because in prior studies there'd been uh, shown to be a relationship based on synovial histopathology the transcriptome changes on response to either IL-6 receptor blockade or TNF blockade, and then looking at the serum correlates in terms of the uh, protein products of those genes, that uh, CXCL13 and soluble ICAM1 were relatively predictive of either responses to IL-6 receptor blockade or to TNF blockade. And given that IL-6 signals through the JAK-STAT pathway and filgotinib is a JAK1 selective inhibitor, we were interested to look at these particular proteins. So if you look at the chart, you can see that for CXCL13, it was highly predictive of ACR50 responses and DAS28 change for the 200 milligram dose. If we now look at the bottom of table 1 on this poster, you can see that the ratio of soluble ICAM1 to CXCL13 was predictive for both uh, at baseline for both uh, filgotinib 100 mg doses and 200 mg doses to uh, response at 12 weeks. 
If you look up to figure two, we can look at this in a little bit more detail. In figure two, there's an exploration of the, the uh, contribution of CRP, of IL-6, but also CXCL-13. So if you have levels of CXCL13 which are higher than the median at baseline, then this enriches for the likelihood of response uh, to ACR50. And in fact, if we then look at the ratio of soluble uh, ICAM1 to CXCL13, we can see again that a low ratio enriches for an ACR50 response. Now this is interesting because the implication here is that if CXCL13 is high, that we're looking at more of a lymphoid-driven pathology. And, and that may relate to the mechanism of action of filgotinib. So what these biomarker studies are revealing is that there may be a role for some simple serum measurements at baseline in terms of stratifying for likelihood of high-end response, where the ratio of soluble ICAM-1 to CXCL13 may have clinical utility in informing those patients that are most likely to respond to this particular treatment, particularly if they have a low level of that ratio. So that's the summary of the key uh, translational finding from this work. My name is Rien Westovers. I'm a professor in rheumatology at the University Hospitals in Leuven, Belgium. And uh, this is uh, at ACR Atlanta. And I presented here at ACR uh, a famous abstract, actually, uh, on phase three outcome of a selective uh, check one inhibitor, filgotinib. And I presented the Finch 3 data. It means the primary outcome of Finch 3 at 24 weeks. And this means filgotinib in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis patients that were naive to methotrexate therapy. So this is uh, part of the big Finch 3 program. Uh, and also this uh, trial is a very big trial, actually, with about 1,250 patients in it. Uh, the design of the study is uh, very classic, actually. It's on early uh, RA. Uh, and we randomized patients in a 2112 uh, order to filgotinib 200 milligram once daily in combination with methotrexate. And methotrexate had to be uh, given uh, weekly up to 20 milligram. Or another group, filgotinib 100 milligram plus methotrexate. And interesting, uh, a filgotinib 200 milligram uh, monotherapy group, that, me that means that we uh, matched uh, methotrexate with placebo tablets. And then, of course, also there was one group uh, with methotrexate only, actually the current standard of treatment in uh, early RA, and we were matching uh, filgotinib with placebo tablets. The primary efficacy endpoint was a proportion of patients that achieved ACR20 response at week 24. Um, this is a classical uh, outcome parameter that we uh, use in this kind of uh, trials. But of course, we use a lot of other uh, outcome parameters that are more stringent and that are also more relevant for practice, like dust remission and so on. Uh, I have to tell you that these patients, uh, you know, to recruit 1,250 patients is a real effort. And it's important to have uh, a participation of patients over the world to match a little bit uh, the and, and or to comply with, with, with relevance later on for the message that uh, goes over the world. And so the interesting thing is that we recruited also 70 patients in Japan, and in total there were about 12 to 13 uh, percent of the patients recruited in Eastern Asia, and for the rest it was uh, patients over the world. So those patients were naive to methotrexate. They could have had a small dose previously. Um, the others, uh, uh, other DMARs were not used. Some patients had a, a limited exposure to sofacelazin, but they had to stop that. And patients that had uh, antimalarials before could continue over uh, the uh, treatment duration, their therapy with antimalarials. So this is interesting, um, and let's see what it brings. Actually, the primary outcome was easily met. Even very impressive, ACR 20% uh, with the filgotinib 200 milligram plus methotrexate group was uh, in 80% uh, reached. So this is important, but when you, uh, and this is a statistically significant difference, so the primary outcome of this study is met, which is always a nice message. But also filgotinib 100 milligram plus methotrexate uh, was reached in 80% of the people. So very, very close to the 200 milligram plus methotrexate. 
And even philgotinib 200 milligram monotherapy was also uh, in, met in a very important uh, percentage, 78%. And uh, methotrexate, which is known as a good drug in uh, early disease, is um, uh, reached, uh, reached also ACR20 in 71% of the population. So that means one could say, well, the placebo arm is high, but actually, you have not to consider methotrexate as a placebo drug here. It is just started from the beginning. And also, we have to notice that there was something particular in the, let's say, the, the characteristics of the patients in this study. So they were then had to, to, to have no exposure previously to methotrexate. Despite this, it appeared that, you know, the mean disease duration before they uh, entered into the trial was more than two years. If we, we went, when we went to look more closely to this, what it meant, then it appeared that the median disease duration was 0.4 years. So what does it mean? That a big number of patients in this trial only uh, were seeing a, a classical synthetic DMART over the a year after the start of their symptoms, which is not classic. And it was also reflected by the fact that one third of the patients uh, already were on uh, glucocorticoids. So already on glucocorticoids without seeing a classical synthetic DMART is not the recommendations uh, currently. This just reflects, I think, uh, some lack of standardization of healthcare in big parts of the world. Now, so the primary outcome was clearly met. And really interesting to see is that the speed of response of this uh, jack in a bit, uh, was uh, very, very uh, rapid. So it was very interesting to see that already after two weeks, there was a clear statistical difference uh, um, over methotrexate as well with forgotten 200 milligram or 100 milligram plus methotrexate and also with monotherapy. So this is interesting. And of course, ACR20 is for statistics, but if, you go, if we go to uh, more uh, stringent outcome measures like ACR50 and ACR70, we were also finding that there was a very important uh, good response. You know, responses of ACR50 up to 60% of ACR70 over 40% are enormous. And actually, this was also reached by monotherapy. And clearly, methotrexate could not reach this target. When we went to look to when we went to look to uh, DAS uh, outcomes, then we have to say that you know DAS CRP uh, remission was in uh, more than fifty percent of the patients, fifty four percent of the patients, to be exact, uh, and only twenty nine percent in methotrexate monotherapy. And you have to know that you know methotrexate is a good drug but can only do it the first, I think, at six months. And uh, we know that Jack and the good can do it earlier. But also Boolean criteria, you know, Boolean remission criteria were very, very, very high. Uh, and, and they were already impressive at 12 weeks and increased even up to 24 weeks. Regarding x-rays, there's no major message. And we know that from this kind of trials within recent years that uh, damage adjoins almost does not occur anymore. So we cannot make many big conclusions, certainly not at 24 weeks. We have to wait uh, the one-year results here. And, you know, so to summarize, these efficacy results are rather impressive for this kind of population. And the interesting um, additional message here is safety, I think. You know, we, we do know that there is some concern about jack inhibitors of uh, specific uh, side effects like thrombombolic events, like anemia, uh, and so on. And the interesting, here, uh, the interesting thing in this trial is that when we looked first to all over uh, adverse events, so also the minor adverse events, uh, we only saw that there was a little bit less um, minor uh, treatment emergent adverse events in the monotherapy group. When we looked closely to that, it means that we saw that this was due to less vomiting, less nausea, so probably this was methotrexate related. When we looked at serious adverse events, they were equally spread over the groups. And uh, this is interesting. Uh, and also, there was no major difference between 200 milligram and 100 milligram in combination with methotrexate, and certainly not for serious infections. They were equal in the two doses, which is interesting. So there is, with a dose increase, better efficacy, 
200 milligram is a little bit better than 100 milligram, but there's no more uh, uh, serious infections. And then the most impressive finding, I think, is the very low number of herpes zoster. There is a concern about herpes zoster in Jack in a Bitter in, as a class. Uh, here we found very, very low numbers equally spread over the arms, including methotrexate only. And uh, to conclude, other uh, interesting uh, or adverse events of interest, like cardiovascular events, were very, very low. And thrombobolic events we did not see in this trial in the patients that were exposed to filgotinib. There was only one uh, in the monotherapy group with methotrexate. was one death in this trial, and interesting to uh, detail this, because this was a patient that already died uh, one week after starting the trial. And unfortunately, she was misclassified. So she had um, polyarthritis in three months and CCP positivity, and therefore she was included in this trial. But after one uh, week in the trial, uh, she uh, died from a major cardiac event in means cardiomyopathy. But after relooking to this case, after relooking and, and re evaluating this case, uh, it appeared that she had actually lupus. So she was misclassified and died because of an unrecognized or too late recognized lupus. So to summarize this, uh, you know, I think that filgotinib in combination with methotrexate at both doses is very effective in controlling RA signs and symptoms. Uh, and also, uh, but this is related to uh, the uh, improvement in uh, disease activity, also uh, improved functionality. I did not talk in detail about patient-reported outcomes, but you would expect if uh, patients do better, they also report better outcomes function in function and, uh, and uh, health. Uh, so this is interesting, the most, because, uh, b b b because of uh, the fact that there was almost no side effects. Um, and some side effects were very classical to methotrexate, and we do know that. So very important to mention also that these results are, let's say, consistent with other trials with filgotinib, and most specifically the uh, phase two program uh, was also the PI in the phase uh, two program, where we saw actually similar results of efficacy. There was also one trial with monotherapy of filgotinib in the phase two program, and these were all in methotrexate refractory patients. And we saw actually the same profiles of response and also the same profiles of safety. So I think this is very promising for the future and needs, of course, more longer follow-up. In the final presentations, Professor Winthrop presents pooled safety data from the Finch studies and Professor Coates presents Phil Gottenib safety data from the Phase 2 psoriatic arthritis trial. Hi, I'm Kevin Winter, professor at Oregon Health Science University in Portland, Oregon. I'm happy to be here at ACR in Atlanta, giving you a quick overview of the poster I'm presenting on the filgotinib safety from phase three trials in RA. This is safety data in the randomized controlled trial, placebo-controlled trial uh, period of weeks zero through 24, using this JAK1 specific molecule. The studies of interest included a biologic IR study, a methotrexate IR study, as well as a methotrexate naive population, Finch 1, 2, and 3. And again, safety data were pooled through 24 weeks. So what did we find through 24 weeks? We found relatively low number and percentage of individuals having adverse events. And the adverse events overall for the filgotinib-treated individuals were similar to that seen in the placebo and adalimumab arms of those studies. With regards to serious infection, 1% of placebo-treated individuals, 2.5% of adalimumab-treated individuals, and 1.4% of filgotinib-treated individuals had a serious infectious event. For herpes zoster, rates were also similar between those arms. 0.6% of individuals on filgo had herpes zoster, which was similar to the 0.6% with adalimumab and 0.4% noted in placebo trials. There were very few opportunistic infections, there were no active tuberculosis uh, infections noted. And then episodes of MACE, DVT, and PE were also similarly uh, unusual in the first 24 weeks. Specifically for DVT and PE, there were five events noted in the placebo arm for 0.3%. Uh, 
And there was two events noted in the filgotinib arm that constituted less than 0.1%. As far as malignancy, of course, this is a 24-week study. One wouldn't expect to see many malignancies. And in fact, very few were observed, four in the placebo arm and one in the filgotinib arm uh, for similar percentages. And there were no gastrointestinal perforations noted. As for deaths, there were two in the placebo arm, one in a filgotinib 100 milligram arm, and three in the filgotinib 200 milligram arm. Overall, 0.2% of patients on filgotinib died, which was similar to what was seen in the placebo arm, where also 0.2% of patients died. In summary, the safety profile of this molecule in weeks 0 to 24 was similar in those patients treated with filgotinib as it was with adalimumab and placebo. We look forward to further follow-up data, long-term safety data, and longer extension data to better understand the safety profile of this molecule. Thank you. My name's Laura Coates, and I'm a rheumatology researcher at the University of Oxford, focusing particularly on psoriatic arthritis. And I'm here to talk about a poster presented this morning looking at the long-term outcomes, both safety and clinical efficacy, of the phase two forgottenib study in psoriatic arthritis. So the aim of this analysis was to look at the outcomes out to 52 weeks for those patients treated with forgottenib in the phase two study, to look specifically at the safety of the drug, although this is a relatively short duration study and a relatively small sample size, so there's a limitation in terms of picking up some of the safety data, and to look at the long-term efficacy and whether that's maintained. So we saw a really good safety profile of filgotinib in the patients with psoriatic arthritis. Although it's only a short study, we didn't see any significant vascular events in terms of DVT or PE, which have obviously been raised as a concern with the JAK inhibitors, and possibly related to its more selective JAK1 targeting. We can see no significant difference on the haemoglobin overall, So no increase in anemia, which we see with some of the non-selective JAK inhibitors. And good maintenance of normal bloods across the board. The safety profile seems to be pretty similar to that of rheumatoid, although the data for rheumatoid involves a lot more patients and a lot more follow-up. So we have a little more certainty there. We saw good maintenance of the efficacy measures across joints and skin in the long-term extension, showing that when people do well on filgotinib, that can be maintained out to the end of a year. Now, obviously, this is still data from a phase two study. It's still relatively small, and we do need further studies to provide licensing for this drug. There are two phase three studies planned, one looking in biologic naive patients and one looking in biologic experienced patients, which will do this and will hopefully start recruiting in 2020. So I think at the moment these findings will not influence clinical practice directly, but in the future, assuming that we also have positive phase three studies, then I think this drug is likely to be licensed for psoriatic arthritis and will provide us with another treatment option and a very selective JAK1 inhibitor that we can use in clinical practice for psoriatic arthritis. Thank you for listening to this edition of Congress Author Podcasts. Make sure to subscribe to the CSF Podcast channel on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts from, so you don't miss out on more ACR 2019 content coming soon. If you found this informative, why not listen to our other podcasts, which include author interviews and a monthly review of the latest cytokine signaling papers hosted by the CSF Steering Committee Chair, Professor McInnes. You can also visit cytokinesignaling.com for access to a wide range of free educational resources, including monthly slide summaries of the latest papers, accredited CME courses and Congress highlights.